I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm the organizer of the Tech Field Day event series. What you're about to see is a presentation with uh, Dell EMC and a panel of independent writers and speakers from around the world who focus on enterprise IT technology. If you'd like to see more about this, you can go to techfieldday.com. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like it, go to youtube.com slash techfieldday. In terms of enterprise data protection, we talked about Sync IQ as a way of basically doing replication. The way Sync IQ works is it takes a snapshot and then at some period later, which you define, it takes another snapshot. The snapshot is at the granularity of a directory and subdirectories that you define. So you might have an application that resides in one set of directories. You might have another application that resides in another set of directories. One of them might need to be replicated every four hours. The other one might need to be replicated on a continuous basis. Um, and so you set basically what that period is. So we have either a period where you define a time frame or we have a uh, what we call continuous replication, where you just say, hey, anytime something changes in this directory tree, I want to kick off a replication job. Now, we don't do it instantaneously. We wait a minute to just let some things quiesce in case you have a lot of IOs that are coming in. Then we take a snapshot. We take another snapshot at the end of the period. We compare the two, uh, what's changed, um, and then basically we send just the changes across. Now, why that's important is we're not going to send the entire file across we're gonna send only the blocks that have changed. So what's been deleted, what's been created, what's been modified, that's what's gonna get sent across. So it's a very uh, a small section of the actual uh, entire directory. It's only the actual amount that's actually churned within that, within that directory tree that gets sent across. So very efficient uh, using that snapshot capability. <laughs> And I feel like I'm a broken record. I don't know whether or not you guys want to know the differences between kind of what, what you know, uh, a traditional easy way of going about doing it and, and the complexity of doing this from a distributed system standpoint. But when we talk about, hey, we just changed the, we just track the changed blocks across the system and send them over to the destination side. Underneath the covers, it's a heck of a lot more than that uh, because, in fact, this is a fully distributed job uh, across the cluster. So think about it. I now have a billion leaf file system, right, that is accreting changes in a, in a million different locations that I need to quickly figure out in O of non-traversal time what is the change set that I have to send over to the alternate side. Well, it turns out that underneath the covers, of course, we use snapshots, but we can directly read the change list out of the file system in a distributed way so that every node is actually participating and helping identify the change set since the last time that we have sent an epic over to the other side. And not only do we use all of the nodes in the system to help read that change set list, but once that change set list is identified, that change set that needs to be sent over to the other side is sharded and sent off to all of the nodes in the cluster. And each node in the cluster actually picks up his pieces of that work queue to send those things over to the destination side so that, for instance, replication, just like dedupe, just like uh, snapshots, just like all of the other kind of cluster-wide jobs that happen, uh, is a distributed thing that scales according to the size of the cluster. Um, so that uh, when you have a 10 node cluster, you can sustain this kind of bandwidth in terms of replication traffic. When you have a 100 node cluster, you can sustain this kind of transfer traffic uh, because it has to scale the same way that the physical, that the logical infrastructure for the file system scales, which means that every single job that David is talking about here is basically a distributed job set across the cluster. And that, that, that uh, applies to pretty much everything. So even the deduplication, again, when we're doing deduplication, it's not deduplication within a node, it's deduplication across the cluster. So we have to basically identify that blocks are the same across the cluster and then go and consolidate them. Uh, a specific file might be striped across multiple nodes. <clears throat> we might go and notice that, hey, a bunch of these blocks actually are duplicate and then we'll free them up and point the metadata to basically reference count those, those blocks that are the similar um, and then free up space in nodes, uh, basically returning the, the capacity to the cluster for use for other data. So very similar to the way the duplication is done. This is an 8KB uh, static window, or sorry, not, not, not a rolling window, but it's an 8KB slice at a time, which is our block size. And we compare one 8KB against another 8 kilobytes, and we say, okay, are they the same? And if they are, then we essentially increment the reference count on the blocks that are being kept as the uh, the actual origin data, 
and we free up the other blocks for use for anything else. Uh, which reduces your, your cluster size requirements. Um, from an NDMP perspective, so we, we have NDMP capabilities for doing backup to tape. There are still customers who want to do backup to tape. Um, we can go and point a directory uh, uh, and say, okay, I want to actually go and backup that directory and subdirectory tree. But NDMP is a single stream protocol. So you'd imagine if you have a multi petabyte cluster, backing up a multi petabyte cluster, if I want to back up the entire cluster, is could take a really long time with a single stream. Uh, so what we've done is we've added the capability to actually go and say, under the covers, I'm going to go and shard up the file system, again, across all the nodes, again, coordinated across all the nodes, into multiple shards, which are then driven as multiple single stream NDMP to your tape infrastructure. And this allows you to basically provide a parallel backup capability that can you know, go multiple times faster than, say, basically a single stream NDMP could. So questions on this one? So again, pretty important for folks who are trying to do tape backup of very large systems. Imagine doing tape backup of a petabyte or multi-petabyte uh, file system would just take forever on a single stream. At what point do you find customers typically just give up trying to even back this stuff up and actually just rely on replication? Um, pretty common. I mean, basically, their replication attach rates are about 70% of customers who actually just use replication as, a, as their backup strategy, or maybe even higher than that these days. Is that generally your recommendation? It is the general recommendation. Remember, the average cluster size is a petabyte. So if you're trying to back it all up in a certain window, if you're just using single stream NDMP, it's, it might be tough to hit that window. With multi stream NDMP, it becomes a lot easier because now if you did 10 streams, it's a tenth of that time, so now you're back into, hey, this could, this could actually work. But, you know, tape is kind of an interesting thing. It's kind of a dead media. So if I back things up into tape, I don't know what I can really do with it. I can't, it's not, it's not fast to restore. I can't really access it for doing live analytics. And so the advantage of using replication as a way of doing backup is that I can actually do stuff with the data that resides in the backup cluster. I can go and I can run analytics against it. I can take a snapshot against it and go use it for some other purposes. Um, and so it's not dead, it's not hidden. It's actually alive and well at the remote location. And it can be used as a, as a disaster recovery uh, technique as well. So it can be used as simultaneously as backup, but also as DR, which is kind of nice. Do you normally recommend for the, for the replica site that they use smart lock? Um, we actually don't recommend that uh, because if you smart lock it, that data, once it's been replicated, then it cannot be changed. Hmm. Uh, so if I was to go replicate it and then I was actually going to change it on this side, I can't do anything to that uh, the other side. Now I can smart lock both sides, which means that data that gets written is locked and then it gets replicated over here and it's locked mm -hmm. and that's it. It's just locked on both sides. So it, can't be, it cannot be changed for X period of years if you want or whatever time frame that you set. But if you were to lock it on just one side and not on the other side, that's, uh, that's a problem because now I'm changing it on one side and okay. I can't change yeah. it on the other side. From a security and compliance perspective, again, I'm going to run these through these pretty quick because we're, we're, we're kind of getting compressed on time here. But we have a role-based administration, which allows me to go and say that for a specific administrator, I want to be able to say that, hey, you have access to go and do a file system operations like snapshots and set up replication. But I don't want you to be able to actually go and look at the data. So I just want you to be able to actually go and set up policies or manage the, manage the file system, but not have access to the actual data itself. Access zones is our version of multi-tenancy. And what this says is basically for a given security domain, say Active Directory or LDAP, um, I can say that users in a specific Active Directory or LDAP can only see certain mount points. And that allows me to logically segregate the cluster into different security domains. So if you belong to one Active Directory tree and you belong to another Active Directory tree, you get to see these mount points, you get to see these mount points, and that's it. From your perspective, the cluster looks like this. And from another user's perspective, the cluster looks like that from the mount points and the data that's available. And we do allow overlapping. So you can actually overlap those uh, security domains. And what that means is that if you have, for example, two organizations that share data that within a specific set of directory trees, uh, um, they may have uh, some amount of data that's visible to both of those access zones. We have up to 50 access zones today, uh, potentially scalable to more in the future. Those access zones are available across all protocols, NFS, SMB, and so on. And you, you can put the, uh, these different logical 
constructs into different VLANs and different subnets so you can have a multi-tenant environment, that kind of thing? Into different VLANs and subnets. So I think we can do VLAN tagging, we can do subnets, yeah. We can even do packet reflection that says that when uh, uh, data comes in across, say, one interface, you can go back across another interface. You can have a DNS praxis zone. So imagine if, uh, if you're a company that was very acquisitive, this happens in financial services. I bought a little small, little small companies. Each one has its own network with its own gateway and DNS. Uh, for its own security domain, I can say that that DNS, that gateway, that Active Directory tree, that security domain is all on this IP range. Yep. It's for these specific set of users. And so those users will always go through that gateway. They'll always use that DNS. It's, it's completely segregated. But in the service provider space? Uh, not quite service providers, but it's more of the enterprise multi-tenancy. So um, think of a bank that bought a, you know, a couple of other small banks. And each one of them have their own kind of IT systems and they have their own kind of security domains. And if you get to multi-tenancy or for service providers, you might have requirements for hundreds of thousands or yep. tens of thousands. We scale to 50 today. Uh, we, we may scale beyond that in the future, but right now it's more for the enterprise space okay. uh, where, uh, let's say, um, the guys in investment banking can't share specific information because it's uh, you know regulated with other parts of the banking uh, lines of business, and so you basically want to segregate them so that they cannot see each other's data for compliance purposes. Worm data protection we've talked about. We have everything from uh, go in and basically set a directory as being a worm directory and then turn files into locked to an auto commit feature, which says that once a file has basically gone into a directory after a specific amount of time when it's kind of quieted down, we'll just automatically lock it. So data comes in, close the file, boom, we lock it, it's been protected. File system auditing we do through an external, uh, what we could do, we do it primarily through an external uh, uh, server called, uh, I guess it's CEE, which is a common event enabler. And what that does is that all of the file system operations are then logged to CEE and then CEE provides connectors for a number of different audit tools and third-party audit tools in the industry. So for example, if you're a Veronis customer or you're a Symantec customer, you can plug into CEE and then consume those logs for reporting uh, who is doing what within the cluster. Uh, the data at rest encryption, so we have a number of our nodes that basically provide two different flavors of node. The node can come in a you know, the normal type of a node or it can come in a data encryption, uh, a, a self-encrypting drive version. And the self-encrypting drives use FIPS compliant self-encrypting drives in the nodes. Um, and though, so if you were to actually take a drive and return it back to us, uh, we wouldn't be able to read the contents of that drive. The keys for the self-encrypting drive are kept on the node itself. So removal of a drive, return the drive because the drive failed, that drive for all intents and purposes is shredded. If you wanna basically just if you had to cut and run in a, in a military environment and you're leaving a camp and you basically could go wipe out all the keys and that cluster becomes completely unreadable um, from that perspective. Um, so there you go. Uh, this, this, that's really how we provide encryption. But we also we provide encryption in a number of different layers in the cluster. So obviously we have protocol level encryption. So from the client <coughs> to the actual uh, node itself, data is encrypted. The, um, Metadata and the caching is encrypted because we, we have self-encrypting flash drives as well. And then as the data is basically persisted to disk, we have self-encrypting drives where the data persists for long term. So the encryption is end to end from the time it leaves the application server to the time it's actually persisted on disk, there's encryption the whole way.